Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining today. I'm excited to talk about, you know, how to look for things like you know, fairness and bias inside of your models, and more importantly, how to detect them. And so a little bit of background on myself. My name is Aparna, previously worked on Uber's ML platform. If you've heard of Michelangelo, I built part of the model store, which, which was eventually kind of, you know, integrated into Michelangelo. Um, and then after that, I actually went to a PhD program in computer vision. And it was honestly during that program where I started thinking about things like ML fairness, you know, how does bias get introduced into our models, especially models like facial recognition. And, you know, for me, at that point, a researcher, you know, what I was thinking about was, you know, I couldn't even answer basic questions about model performance, model service metrics, you know, there was just no way that I as an individual could have been able to answer really complex and hard questions around model bias or model fairness. And so um, that, that's what kicked me off to, to building Arise, which is focused on ML observability. And so in today's talk, what you know, I'm gonna cover is, you know, especially across a lot of different organizations that we talk with and work with, you know, what are the challenges of measuring fairness in the real world in practice look like? Um, you know, and then jump into kind of what, how do you even begin to measure, you know, fairness? It's different in different industries. And so we'll cover a little bit of, you know, definitions, give some intro into that. It won't cover all of them. And then lastly, I think, you know, I want you guys to leave with a little bit of how can you start to address or start thinking about fairness in the context of your own, in your own orgs. Cool. Well, let me first jump into, you know, what are the challenges with looking at ML fairness in, in the real world. You know, first off, you know, you know, a lot of these kind of, you know, if you look at tools like Fairness Flow or, you know, IBM's kind of, you know, 360, you know, a lot of them assume you have the protected class attributes available to, to look at and to look at kind of, you know, specific groups and measure these, these metrics. But in the real world, oftentimes that data that's handed to modelers or by the time it even, you know, is stored in, in some of these you know, raw data platforms, you know, it could be stripped of some of these protected attributes. And so it won't come neatly labeled with here's the gender, or here's the age, or here's, you know, what ethnicity they are. And so some of this protected attribute information could be missing. You might not have access to it. And, you know, there's, there's actually a whole theory and a whole, you know, way of measuring fairness that, you know, if I don't include that information in my models, it must mean that I'm not biased. Uh, you know, heads up, that's not true, but it's definitely one reason why, you know, these protected attributes are, are not given to the modelers. Or, and, and, you know, there's a big debate around, you know, should they even be given? Is it violating privacy? So massive challenge. You know, let's assume that you even had access to that information. There's not a lot of you know, people with that training to know how do you go check for bias? You know, there's no formalized practice. There's no, you know, common, you know, here's what you check in this industry. Here's what you check in that industry. A lot of this is very new, very nuanced. There's no formalized processes or people to, to kind of, you know, guide you in these organizations of what to go check for. So it's really hard. A lot of this is, is still kind of coming out in research even. You know, let's say you could, let's say that you had this information and you knew what to go check for, you know, you do have to make a case, you know, in some, in some cases that, you know, there's a trade-off between measuring these fairness metrics and understanding the trade-off that it could have on the business. You know, if you're going to make sure that your model's uh, not biased and, you know, if it might, no, I'm not saying in all cases, but in some, some industries, there could be a tangible business impact to where you might not be accurate in, in certain um, individuals. And then lastly, you know, the, the job of deciding, you know, is this trade-off okay? You know, should I go invest not only in understanding fairness, making sure there's people on my team to go do this, you know, that responsibility today is diffused across, you know, the model builders, you know, the business, uh, you know, stakeholders, product managers. And so this diffuse responsibility really makes it difficult to you know, understand who's responsible in my organization for making sure we're not biased. And, you know, you might ask, you know, how does this bias even happen? Like, where does this all, where does all of this kind of like come into play? 
and, and there's a ton of different ways that these bias can be introduced. You know, to give you an example, one of them is kind of skewed samples. If you have, you know, historically in certain neighborhoods, you know, the police department, for example, let's say dispatched more officers um, because there was historically more crime right there. You know, what's going to happen is that these models build on historical data. And so these historically skewed examples are going to influence, you know, the data set that that model is trained on. The model is going to learn from that and decide, you know, oh, I should dispatch more officers in XYZ regions. And so the, the historical skews definitely, you know, one, one major factor or cause of bias in systems. You know, second is, you know, there's also human bias that's introduced in these data. So, you know, if you have a hiring manager who's, you know, you know, labels, kind of hand labels an applicant and decides the capability, you know, what happens is that it's not only that the model's learning, now there's kind of human bias that's also been, you know, you know, added to that data set. So if that manager themselves was, you know, biased against certain, you know, um, gender or certain race, that bias will now be introduced into that data set. I mean, even if you don't have kind of the protected class information within the data, if you're using things like sensitive attributes, you know, those sensitive attributes like, you know, neighborhood, which can indicate things like race, um, can, can also be used to learn these other kind of proxy, you know, these proxies can basically be used to learn about sensitive attributes. Um, you know, Sample size is another one. If you don't have a large set of samples from a certain group or minority, you know, it's, you know, you have very few samples that are trying to, you know, give the full picture of that entire group. And so it's, it's you know, a lot of complex reasons why bias is introduced, but, you know, it makes it, you know, even more challenging to figure out, you know, how do you go measure this? And so first, before we even get into measuring, you know, what are these protected attributes? You know, how, 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 what are protected attributes you should be checking that your models aren't biased against? You know, there's there's actually a lot of legislation around, you know, most of the protected attributes that we have today. Things like, you know, sex, race, color, religion, you know, disability status, um, you know, veteran status. A lot of these are actually protected, protected attributes that, you know, legally you cannot discriminate based off of this information. And, and you know, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, this list might not be you know, fully comprehensive. You know, I was talking to um, an organization that sells clothes the other day using models. And one of the things they care about is actually size discrimination. So they want to make sure that, you know, based off of what this person has bought or what type of, you know, um, you know, si what types of clothes this person has bought, that they're not targeted for certain types of inventory or certain types of clothes. And so it's just, it's very interesting because each industry might have certain of these protected attributes that are more important or more relevant. And in other industries might be completely different. And so what's fair even legally is, is something that, you know, as a country we're, we're still working towards. And so with that, you know, what I thought I could do is just kind of talk through some of common fairness definitions. And, you know, as you know, these are not at all kind of all encompassing or inclusive. There's actually a ton of researchers doing amazing work. There's we have 20, 30 definitions that are, are kind of really common that are out there. But at least at a high level, let's let's kind of go through and talk about, you know, what are these metrics, give you an idea of kind of what, you know, where each of these are used, some of the trade-offs, and then, you, you know, start to paint a picture of kind of at least for, for your models, you know, which ones might work and which ones might not work. First ones, of course, kind of, and I'd say this one's maybe the most commonly used, you know, across across the industries, is unawareness. You know, if I don't include these sensitive attributes into my model, then clearly, you know, my models aren't biased. There was nothing to learn off of. And, and this one has a really big, you know, problem in that, you know, models can learn off of proxy information that could hide this protected class, you know, protected class information, and you end up kind of bleeding in these, these biases without even being aware of it. And in some organizations, you know, that's enough to kind of, you know, say this model's okay. But, you know, it definitely begs the question, you know, is this fair? Is this really, you know, fair just because we're not introducing that as a, as a you know, true feature into the model? Um, and I'll, we'll actually go through an example of this in, in the next slide. You know, second is kind of, we'll, we'll also dive into this as kind of 
individual fairness versus group fairness. You know, what are the trade-offs? You know, group fairness is making sure that people within you know, different groups have the same, um, you, know, rep you know, it could be things like representation or proportional representation. So if you're saying that someone should be approved for a loan, you know, across the, you know, different groups, there's kind of proportional parity um, versus something like individual fairness, which is looking at, you know, individuals, even across these different groups, um, you know, and individuals kind of measured based off of their own, own capabilities. So two individuals that look similar, have similar capabilities, are given the same outcome, which is really hard, which is actually really hard to do in, in kind of the real world. You know, there's, you know, uh, you know, other ways such as equalized odds where, you know, what this one's kind of saying is if you have, you know, two different groups, you know, it's equally likely for, you know, people within each of those groups to not only be, you know, for qualified individuals to be approved or, you know, rejected. And so you're, not only is it, Kind of your approval rates are similar, but also you're, you're equally likely to be rejected, even if you're of, you know, either group. Um, and it's really interesting, kind of to try to understand where does this one work better than maybe something like, you know, individual fairness. Um, and the last one will kind of just high level cover is kind of counterfactual fairness, where it's something like, you know, if you have, you know, one individual who's who's kind of part of one group and they were evaluated and there was a label given to them, you know, what label would have been given to them if they were you know, if you just change that one protected attribute about them. And so just really kind of, you know, and that's kind of one way of saying, okay, well, obviously in this case, just because that one label was changed, this person's outcome has changed. So clearly there's, there's something going on here. It's not, not really fair, but it's harder to do in models where let's say you didn't even include that protected class information into the model. So it's, it's, it's kind of a little, you know, how, how would you have balanced you know, switching the, the group label for this individual. And so let's, let's kind of maybe dive in deeper into kind of, you know, what does unawareness mean? Um, you know, if you remove some of this protected class information, it, you know, in, as an input into the model, you know, does that really solve your, your problem? Is that even a good idea? You know, and in, you know, this is actually, you know, one of the, you know, research paper that, that kind of dove into, you know, in certain cases, um, especially in large feature, feature space, spaces, if you have protected attributes, um, you know, typically kind of given other features that, you know, are correlated with the protected class information, if you have enough of these, then you're basically going to, you know, you're basically, it's almost as if you just included the protected class information within the data set anyway. So in this case, this is kind of the group predictor, group predictor even with just a certain small number of features, you're still kind of able to, you know, you're, this is kind of how accurate you are able to be able to predict the group with just a small number of features. And the more and more number of features you add, you know, you kind of get closer and closer to basically having this protected class attribute, you know, you know, figured out. And, you know, so that's why, you know, unawareness is not often, you know, your end all be all solution to tackling fairness. In other cases, you know, it, you know, removing it might not even be a good idea. Um, you know, there's legitimately in kind of medical, in some certain industries like the medical industry, where medication sometimes depends on the race. And so, you know, if it's correlated with kind of underlying, you know, uh, causal factors that impact certain groups more than others, then maybe you'd want that information so that you can properly diagnose them and then give them proper medication. So no fairness through unawareness is, is kind of, you know, the way to think about it because just because you've removed this information doesn't mean your your models are blind to it and neither should you be. You know, the second one that I kind of wanted to, to kind of dive into is really kind of, and you'll see a lot of, you know, fairness metrics divide themselves into, you know, group fairness versus individual fairness. Um, you know, group fairness is really thinking about, you know, groups you know, group A and group B are able to receive similar treatments or similar kind of outcomes. Um, and so, you know, women should receive kind of the same proportional or kind of similar types of, of kind of labels as kind of the, let's say that the men do. And so that's kind of, you know, one way of thinking about you have different groups, defined very protected attributes, should be receiving similar outcomes. It's 
sometimes done through proportionality, sometimes it's kind of equal number, but it really, you know, you'll see a whole group of metrics that call themselves that fall under kind of group fairness. And then there's another set of kind of metrics that call themselves a little bit more individual fairness, where, you know, similar individuals, um, you know, should receive similar treatments or outcomes. And, you know, in reality, this one can be really hard to do, right? Because you, you know, even if you just think about kind of, you know, what a lot of these models are trying to do, they are really taking a risk based off of some information about these individuals. And so it's not really a concrete kind of linear formula that you're doing to decide if it's above this, this person gets a loan, you're really kind of taking a risk probability. And so trying to, you know, in, you know, in different industries, it'd be totally different, but, you know, identifying what, what makes two individuals similar can also be really, really uh, tough. And so just to give you an example of kind of group fairness and where's an area where this might not be the right metric, you know, if you're thinking about a bank, which is evaluating, let's say a hundred different mortgage applications, 70 are for men, 30 are for women. You know, if you think about something like demographic parity, percentage of men and women who get approved should be the same. You know, let's say 50% of men who get a, who applied should, you know, should get their mortgages approved, and it should be 50% for women as well. Um, you know, this this sounds great, except you know, it, it could be unfair if there's a higher percentage of let's say loan worthy individuals in either groups. So let's say there were legitimately more women, you know, of that 30 who applied who were much more, you know, loan worthy you know, maybe it shouldn't just be 50%, maybe it should be higher. And so what it does is that it, it, it makes you pick kind of, and, and there's actually whole groups of research around subgroup fairness and things like that, that try to balance group fairness and individual fairness. But, you know, it really is kind of a dilemma in this situation of what matters more, um, you know, is this really truly fair? And there's, there's kind of a, you know, there's, I'll, I'll kind of link this afterward, but there's really kind of a, you know, a whole tree that some people go through to understand, you know, what metrics make sense in what scenario, you know, first, does your business problem or the model that you're building require fairness to, you know, address the fact that you have different kind of you know, groups represented, you want to make sure that representationally, you know, you're, you're, you're handling kind of equal opportunities, or do you want to, you know, make sure that the different errors that are happening in your model are, um, you know, balanced. So when you're wrong, you're wrong equally fair. You know, you're not just wrong for certain groups or you're more wrong for, you know, certain um, populations. You're equally wrong across different, um, across different groups in, in the population. And this is worth kind of diving into it much deeper, but I just wanted to give you an idea of kind of how complex this can be to understand what metrics, you know, make sense for your model. And it's really kind of, a, you know, it, it ties into how should you, start thinking about bringing model fairness into your organization. You know, I, I, and I've kind of broken this up into three, three kind of groups. One is really kind of an organizational investment. You know, at an organizational level, there's people thinking about, you know, similar to maybe how your org thinks about privacy, chief privacy offered, pri privacy officer, maybe deciding what the structure is, how often, you know, they're going to be checked for things like, you know, data security risks, and so making sure that there's structure, there's people in place to think about fairness, um, and then incentives for being able to identify or catch these kind of risks to the organization. Second is really kind of, you know, defining this ethical framework. So even though different business problems can be different, identifying what is the right way to think about what metrics, um, what are we optimizing for, what makes, you know, you know, how should we begin to frame the problem is I think, you know, a really important thing to do cross org as well. And then lastly, of course, none of these things kind of stay perfect. And so having tools for visibility, having tools to monitor this so that, you know, you can't improve what you can't measure. So having tools to get this and surface this up is really important to, to keep it successful. And so, you know, tons of things from an organizational perspective around, you know, tops down strategy, do you have buy-in from, from, you know, leaders of your organization? You know, what teams are going to drive this, what programs, what's the cadence that they're going to check for this. And then, you know, for the individuals who are kind of building the models at a day to day level or maintaining it, um, you know, what software or tools is really going to enable them to to carry out their job effectively. 
And, and this is really, to be honest, where, you know, where I fit in or where we're kind of my interests kind of lie is really on kind of the, I'll jump to the side first, is really kind of around ML observability, which is, you know, you can't um, surface up problems or surface up where these issues are if you can't even, you know, if you're shipping models blind into production. And so ML observability is not just looking at, hey, is my model performing well, but it's also, you know, is it doing the right things? Is it, you know, fair? Is it biased for certain groups? And so there's a piece of this, which actually, you know, you should validate before the model is even deployed. Is it, is it, you know, good enough from a performance perspective, but is it also, you know, free of bias and, and, you know, not just catering to certain groups. Second is, you know, when there are issues, being able to, you know, surface them up through monitoring tools and platforms and alert you that there's clearly an issue here and then giving you the tools to be able to, you know, troubleshoot them and, and kind of get to where the problem really, really is. And, and surface up kind of, you know, using explainability, why, you know, what, what was the key kind of important aspects or features that kind of drove this decision for not just one individual person or one individual kind of group, but across the board, what was driving this, this model. And, and there's a ton of different ways of kind of, you know, post knowing that this is an issue that, you know, you can decide to, you know, being able to measure this will make sure that, you know, whatever fairness pipeline that you do have, whether it's, you know, tackling that bias in the data through pre-processing or tackling it in, you know, in kind of when you're training the models, or, you know, if you decide to tackle that, you know, post kind of the models made a prediction, and then you're going to modify that output, you have a system in place that actually can, can help you surface up if this is doing what it's supposed to do, and, and giving you kind of the best insights for how to go fix it. Um, and I think, you know, for, for anyone kind of listening, you know, obviously, you know, this is an important piece of, of you know, us as, as kind of, you know, model builders and, and, you know, ML practitioners, you know, it's a critical part of making machine learning successful, not just kind of delivering better performing models, but also making sure that models work for, for the people. So, um, you know, thank you so much for joining the talk. I hope that that was useful and feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions and would like to talk more. Thanks everyone.